Hello, John Perry here. You are about to watch a talk that I did at the College of Charleston. I did the talk on Darwin Day of 2018. And you don't actually have to watch it. You could probably just listen to this while you're cooking or whatever. But there are two spots in it where I show stated clearly animations. You might want to watch during those parts because there's a lot of fairly important visuals going on there. But especially if you're already familiar with my work, you've already watched most of my animations, you've probably already seen those. It's the Miller-Urey experiment animation and the RNA world hypothesis animation. So, you know, feel free to just keep listening while you're cooking or jogging or whatever it is you happen to be doing. Without further ado, here's me talking at Darwin Day 2018. Just out of curiosity, has anyone ever seen a Stated Clearly animation? Like, oh, quite a few of you. Oh, I made those. <laughs> so uh, I, I really want this to be kind of a loose discussion. And just, just to kind of get people used to blurting things out and a little bit more comfortable with each other in the classroom here, I want people to kind of break into groups of, I don't know, four to six people and see if you can figure out amongst you, just using your brains, no, go no Googling it. Flight evolved four times, true flapping flight, in four different lineages of animals on planet Earth. Can you figure out which four those are? So let's just kind of like break into groups real quick, and talk about that, introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and think if you can figure it out. <laughs> okay, so I think that's enough time. Can everybody hear me now with this microphone even in the back? Okay. All right, what did you come up with? Just start, start saying them. What are the four different lineages that flight evolved within? Pterodactyls, birds. Pterodactyls, so pterosaurs in general. Birds. Mammals. Insects. Insects and mammals. Mammals being, of course, bats, right? So, good work. I'm going to be talking today more about chemical evolution than biological evolution. How did life emerge? As mentioned, I do animations on genetics and evolution. I've got a bunch of them on the website at statedclearly.com. If you want to go check those out, I also have my YouTube channel. You can follow me at, on Twitter, at statedclearly. And it's Darwin week, so we're talking about evolution. And Darwin's, Darwin's big discovery was natural selection. People had suspected that evolution or common ancestry was a thing for a long time, since ancient times actually. But it wasn't seriously considered because nobody knew exactly how it would have happened. How did life diversify and do so in the incredibly successful ways that we see living things, um, it, the way that they're built today? How on earth could, could the order and complexity that, that exists in life, how could that come about? And Darwin discovered that the, the key missing component to this was natural selection. So he described evolution as a very simple sort of equation. Descent with modification, which just means that when parents have offspring, those parents are slightly different than each other and slightly different than their parents. They descend with modifications. And then that is acted upon by selection, natural selection being the, the main one that he talked about, but there's also sexual selection. And you know, now that we have humans meddling with things, there's artificial selection when we selectively breed animals and plants and so on. And if you have descent with modification plus selection, you get adaptive evolution. That was his big contribution to science, was figuring this out. And this has enabled us to understand all kinds of different things. The theory of evolution is extremely applicable. Not only has it helped biologists understand how new species evolve, which is really interesting, but it's also helped farmers better man manage pests. We learned how uh, pests adapt to our attempts to kill them, and we found ways using evolution, understanding evolution, how to outsmart their, their adaptations. Governments have used our understanding of, of evolution to manage animal populations. Uh, we see this a lot with fisheries. Um, I'm from Oregon, and we, have, we care a lot about salmon there. And we, we use a lot of evolutionary theory to manage salmon populations. The wild, and that we also have domesticated salmon now that are raised in hatcheries. And nations are using them to manage epidemics. So we use our understanding of evolution to control things like cholera and other outbreaks of diseases. We've actually been able to, to tame cholera in certain circumstances by understanding how it evolves and how it reacts to different pressures that we can put on either with medications or with cleaning the water. 
we can actually get cholera to evolve into in, in certain forms that we want that we want it can be more benign and then finally and this is kind of more recent we've been really applying evolution that that equation that darwin came up with descent with modification plus selection equals adaptive evolution we've been applying that to our understanding of cancer we now see cancer as you have a cell line that rebels essentially in your body it starts trying to reproduce and evolve on its own it really becomes its own little organism inside of you that your immune system then has to fight. And if your immune system fails to fight it if, it, if it's able to adapt and evolve fast enough, it can escape that attack from the immune system. And you actually have a battle between the cancer and your, your other cells. And seeing cancer in this light has allowed us to, to make several breakthroughs in cancer treatment. Not only that, but we are actually evolving drugs now in the lab. There is a drug called amatinib, which is for the treatment of chronic myelogenous leukemia. And to create that, we used Darwin's equation. We, we had a molecule that worked somewhat well, and we used a process that mutated that molecule, and then we tested it against different cell lines, different cancers, until finally we got one that worked really, really well and had very few side effects. And so we're we're using this as an engineering tool now to engineer molecules, and they're actually engineers that do like buildings and uh, windmills and things like that that are actually using a similar process. They're using Dar that process that Darwin discovered. So it, it really has changed the world. It's changed how we think about biology. It's changed how we do things as a civilization. And not only that, it's also answered a couple of my favorite little questions. You know, curing cancer is cool, but it also helped us figure out which came first, the chicken or the egg. If you look back in the fossil record, you find that amniotic eggs, they emerged at least 312 million years ago. We see the first amniotes. Can anyone describe what an amniotic egg is? A private pond. A private pond. That's good, yeah. And the amniotic egg, the, the amniote, the amniotic membrane is a special membrane that evolved allowing animals to lay their eggs on land instead of depending on the water. You can keep that moisture in, it won't dry out. The first amniotes, we suspect, evolved about 312 million years ago. There are several different species um, that emerge around that time, and it appears that they are no longer stuck at the water's edge. They could actually travel out and lay their eggs on land. So that, 312 million years ago, and then the first chicken, if you want to count Archaeopteryx, <laughs> well, would have been somewhere around 150 million years ago. So the egg came first. We finally know, we can finally answer this child's riddle. Also, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? A woodchuck would chuck as much wood as a woodchuck should in order to survive and reproduce within its perspective environment. <laughs> so, yeah. Cancer, curing cancer is one thing, but now we can answer this. But there are a few questions that a simple appeal to evolution cannot answer. One of which, I don't know if Darwin was really bothered by it, uh, but people certainly have been perplexed by this since then. Darwin did think about it a little bit, but this is a line from the end of his book, the, his original, his first edition of the book, a very famous line. He says, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And the big point I want to talk about here is that he here just didn't even try and answer the question about the origin of life. He said, that these, these several powers, having been breathed into a few forms or into one, that's what got it all started. And this is, the language he's using is kind of, uh, it's, it's very biblical and it, there's the breath of life in Genesis. And it was an appeal to the popular ideas at the time too, um, relating to what people called the vital force. People who were studying biology and even chemists who were studying biology believed that there was some sort of a vital force, something that science didn't understand, maybe something that science could not ever understand, maybe it was something that could never be studied or understood. There was something spooky about living things. There was a ghost in the machine. People believed that 
all organic chemistry, the thing that separated organic chemistry from you know, general chemistry was this vital force. It was producing these organic molecules. Darwin's language here made a lot of sense to people at the time. Just to note, those several powers that he's talking about here, that is the ability to reproduce. In order for evolution to work, again, we need descent with modification acted upon by selection. And descent with modification requires some sort of reprodu reproduction or replication that is imperfect. There has to be variation. Uh, offspring cannot be Id perfectly identical to their parents. If they are, you won't get any evolution. Things will just stand still. And so those several powers that he's talking about here, that, that is the ability to reproduce. The vital force was actually kind of falling out of favor among scientists a little bit before Darwin's time. This is Frederick Wohler. He was a German chemist. And one day while doing an experiment, messing around with some molecules, he accidentally made urea. <laughs> he made pee without peeing. And this doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, but a lot of historians kind of put this as the big thing that, that made at least chemists give up on the idea of the vital force. Because what he did is he made an organic molecule using only general, you know, basic chemical reactions. And when we, re we realized this was possible, I mean, urea is a pretty simple molecule, but when we realized that, that this was possible, everybody started tinkering and experimenting and trying to figure out what else we could make. What other biomolecules could we make using just normal chemical reactions? And that, that really opened up the door eventually for experiments and thinking about the origin of life. What Wohler began to uncover is that life is not powered by a vital force, at least it doesn't seem to be, it's powered by chemistry. Living things are chemical systems. We are extremely complicated chemical systems, but we are chemical systems. And when we start to think of ourselves that way, it's not always fun to think, yeah, I'm a chemical system. But when we do that, that opens up the door to all sorts of medications and all sorts of innovations uh, that are really applicable to our lives today. One of the other things that it opened us up to was speculation that life emerged from chemistry. And in 1952, that speculation became legitimate scientific experiment. And I've got a, an animation I want to show you that talks about that first experiment, the Miller-Urey experiment. Stated Clearly presents, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? It was once believed that if you left food out to rot, living creatures like maggots and even rats would simply poof into existence. The idea was called spontaneous generation. A series of experiments starting in the 1600s disproved this idea, and in the 1800s, a new scientific law was proposed. Life only comes from life. It's true that rats, maggots, and even microbes are far too complex to simply poof into existence, but in 1859, English naturalist Charles Darwin put forth the theory of evolution. In it, he showed that under the right circumstances, relatively simple creatures can gradually give rise to more complex creatures. Given this information, serious thinkers began to wonder, is it possible that simple life forms actually could come from non-living matter? Not by poofing into existence, but through a natural gradual process similar to what we see in biological evolution. Darwin himself mentioned this idea when writing to a friend. But if, and oh what a big if, he wrote, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, and so on present, that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. In 1924, Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin published a book which he titled The Origin of Life. In it, he outlined his thoughts on a gradual progression from simple chemistry to living cells. He imagined the early ocean as a primordial soup, a rich collection of complex molecules produced by natural chemical reactions. In this soup, further reactions could take place, eventually producing living cells. At the time, Darwin's warm little pond and Oparin's primordial soup were really just speculation. They were founded on a good understanding of chemistry and biology, but they could not be considered legitimate scientific hypotheses because no one had found a way to test or observe them. Science, after all, is the study of observable facts, 
and an ongoing conversation about how those facts can be best linked together. Chemical reactions like those proposed by Darwin and O'Perrin are not expected to leave an observable fossil record. Without either having fossils to examine or a time machine to travel back and observe what happened, how could scientists even begin to study the origin of life? In the 1950s, Stanley Miller, then a graduate student at the University of Chicago, came up with an idea. We could simulate early Earth conditions in the lab and then carefully watch what happens. If you can't study fish in the sea, set up an aquarium. Working with his professor, Harold Urey, Miller designed an apparatus to simulate the ancient water cycle. Together they put in water to model the ancient ocean. It was gently boiled to mimic evaporation. Along with water vapor, for gases of the atmosphere they chose methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. These are simple gases which scientists at the time thought were probably abundant on the ancient Earth. They added a condenser to cool the atmosphere, allowing water molecules to form drops and fall back into their ocean like rain. The ancient Earth would have had many sources of energy, sunlight, geothermal heat, and even thunderstorms, so they added sparks to the atmosphere to simulate lightning. The goal of the experiment was not to create life, but to simply test the first step in O'Perrin's model. Can simple chemistry naturally give rise to the complex molecules of life? After running the experiment for just one week, their ocean became brownish black. Careful analysis revealed that through a series of reactions, many complex molecules had been produced. Among these were amino acids, special molecules of life that we once thought could only be built inside the bodies of living creatures. This was a pivotal breakthrough in science, so significant in fact, that it gave rise to an entirely new field of research now known as prebiotic chemistry. Scientists don't know for sure if the gases used by Miller really were the most common gases of the ancient Earth. Because of this, many experiments have since been done, showing that the molecules of life can form in a wide variety of environments with different starting chemicals and different sources of energy. Sugars, lipids, and amino acids have even been found on meteorites. This suggests that the molecules of life formed all throughout the ancient solar system and may be forming right now in other regions of our galaxy. Together these discoveries tell us that O'Perrin's primordial soup and Darwin's warm little pond could have easily existed in one way or another on our ancient planet. So to sum things up, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? The Miller-Urey experiment was our first attempt at simulating ancient Earth conditions, in this case, the ancient Earth's water cycle, for the purpose of testing ideas about the origin of life. The Miller-Urey experiment is significant for two main reasons. First, though it was not a perfect simulation of the early Earth, it clearly demonstrated for the first time that biomolecules can form under ancient Earth-like conditions. Second, the experiment took what was once mere speculation, the idea that life may have emerged from chemistry, and transformed a portion of that speculation into legitimate, testable science. Many questions remain to be answered about the origin of life, but scientists from many nations and many fields of study are now following Stanley Miller's lead. They're finding ways to turn those questions about the origin of life into testable, scientific hypotheses. Simulation experiments cannot tell us exactly how life formed in the past, but if enough of them are done, they could eventually tell us if it's possible for life to emerge from chemistry. I'm John Perry, and that's the Miller-Urey experiment stated clearly. All right, that was my animation on the Miller-Urey experiment. Any questions on that? Uh, my animations are done. I draw them in Flash. I've got a, a Wacom monitor, so I can draw right onto my monitor. And I use Flash. It's actually, it's now Adobe Animate. They just changed the, the branding on it. But I do everything in Flash, then I transfer it over to Adobe Premiere and, and put it out as a video. Upload it to YouTube. Usually takes about two months to do an animation. And question, yeah, questions about animation stuff, or how, I, how the heck I got this job. Uh, all of those things are welcome, yes. What's that? The first one that I did was in 2012. 
the, the first stated clearly animation. I had been tinker, tinkering with it before that. My background is actually in art. I studied graphic design just at a community college. My education felt like it was not very good. So I, but I found a website called lynda.com that teaches you how to do all sorts of, use all kinds of different software. And I learned animation on that website. And it was never applicable to my job. I was, I was building websites and designing logos for people, and I hated my job. And then in the side, I would do science lessons and upload them to YouTube. Uh, the first one was, what is DNA and how does it work? And that's one of the ones that has over a million views. Uh, people start, just started using it like crazy in their classrooms. And then I talked to, I had questions about the origin of life, so I talked to uh, Nicholas Hudd, who is the director of the Center for Chemical Evolution. I figured he'd know if anyone, I just called him during office hours, <laughs> uh, which is a fun trick. If you ever, if you ever find yourself outside of an academic community and you want access to professors, the top people, just call them during office hours. And they, they will answer their phone. And so I talked to him. He got excited about what I, I was doing and ended up giving me a grant. And that was the first paid project I did doing this sort of thing. And now it's all I do. So I work for different universities, different research groups. And I work for, in the private industry, I work for cancer research groups. It's been quite a ride. I've been doing this now, yeah, since 2012. And full time for about three years now as my actual job. So. I'm not sure the con with the conversion question. I'm not sure you might know that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you, go ahead. Well, yeah. W w as far as the purity goes, um, I'm actually not sure the purity that they started with. But there's lots of easy ways to tell if you, your molecules are contamination or if they if they actually came from the experiment. And we were actually just talking about this yesterday. One of the ways is you know living things have certain carbon isotopes that we can test for, so you can test for contamination that way. And there's also the chirality of the amino acids. If you have a mixture of left-handed and right-handed molecules, then you know that they were actually produced in your experiment. If you have only one or the other, uh, there's a possibility of contamination there. I can weigh in on that too. So I'm a, I'm a chemist. So the the stuff that they make in those in those big uh, round-bottom flasks is super messy. So it's not pure at all. So there, there's. It's one of those things where if you're looking for a molecule that's pretty small, you'll probably find it. And it becomes an analytical challenge of actually determining what all molecules are present. Um, and uh, they actually have to do these like fractionations based on solubilities. And like they add acids to dissolve some things and bases to dissolve other things. Um, it's pretty complicated to, to, to like separate all the molecules out because it's such a complex mix. Um, there's actually a lot of amino acids um, in that mixture that are not found in biology, right? So there's, there's 20 amino acids in your proteins. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the ones that you make in those mixtures are not in your body. And then some of the ones that are in your body are also not in those mixtures. So that's kind of a separate question of how did that, those, that first amino acid set kind of chemically evolve to what we have today and whether that happened kind of after biology started or um, early on the Earth. But the answer, if the, if the reaction is pure or not, it's not pure. It's, 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 very, it's very impure. Um, and it doesn't really matter. Um, like, you can, you can add in different gases and things and make different compounds, but a lot, you still, you'll still generally make amino acids. Um, just a tip, don't do this at home unless you know what you're doing, because you're basically making a bomb, right? So you're pressurizing these gases in like a little container. So um, this can be done very safely, but make sure you talk to a chemist before you just start thinking with this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, the only thing that the Miller-Urey experiment showed us was that, yes, it is possible to get these monomers. but how on earth do you get, once you have these monomers, how do you sort them into a, you know, a high enough concentration for some sort of you know, useful chemical system to emerge? We're nowhere near replication, right? Replication is, uh, the big goal in life origins chemistry is to get to a, a system naturally 
under, under circumstances that would have existed on the early earth before anything alive existed. We want to be able to go from that to a chemical system that can replicate itself, make a copy of itself. And that, we, are, we have not answered that question. We're a long ways from that. But we're, ta we're tackling this question from both ends. So we have, we have experiments that are starting with sort of these dirty chemical mixes like you get in the Miller-Urey experiment. So we have people that are starting there and trying to move towards something that might look like a self-replicating system. And we have researchers that are starting with, uh, that are starting with living cells and trying to figure out how simple can you get this system to be and have it still work. So people are going out at both ends. And what we've found when we study life, there's been a lot of excitement around RNA. So we have DNA and we have RNA. There's a lot of excitement around RNA as being possibly the first, uh, chains of RNA being possibly the first self-replicating entities. Because chains of RNA, first of all, they're found in every single living thing, including viruses, which some people may or may not consider to be alive. And, and RNA is, it's, it's crucial to, it, to replication. I mean, chains of RNA are what are being replicated. Genes are what are being replicated. If we really look at biology, we can actually describe biology completely from the level of a gene. It's, it's kind of like describing the video I just showed you with zeros and ones. It's not always useful to look at life at the level of, of a gene, but genes are the simplest replicators. And RNA is the most likely candidate that we know of right now for being the original replicator. And so with that, I want to show a video about the RNA world hypothesis, this idea that life, uh, that RNA was the first replicator. And, yeah. So you, you mentioned in this miller experiment that they saw amino acids, but RNA is a, basically a complex sugar? Yes. Not in the Miller-Urey experiment, but in other experiments we have, um, and we really don't have, we, we don't have any experiments that I know of, maybe you know of some that I don't, that are producing those in a high enough yield for the RNA world to work yet. Um, uh, Ram Krishnamurthy just published a paper probably two months ago with a possible solution to that, but ribose, which is the sugar that RNA is made of, you get you got a sugar and a base. The bases are produced readily in uh, Miller-Urey type experiments, but the sugars are not. They don't last very long. Ram Krishnamurthy thinks that he might, he he's he's discovered something that might might lead to stable sugars, either stable sugars or really rapid production of them, so that even though they are not very stable, they're, they're being made so quickly that they end up being stable in a particular system. But that is still one of the questions that's, that's unsolved, is how do we get high quantities of RNA nucleotides and DNA nucleotides for life to originate? One of the other options for that, we've found uh, several other alternatives to RNA that might have been the first, the original replicating molecules and that's being investigated by Nicholas Hudd in his laboratory. He's got several different, different things that he's looking at, but that is uh, one of the big problems in life origins chemistry. But this one that we're gonna see is kind of working from the cell backwards to RNA, and pretty much everything in the middle is still pretty mysterious. We can go back to RNA and then we hit a wall. Stated Clearly presents what is the RNA world hypothesis? If you were to go back in time 120 million years, you'd find yourself in a dinosaur world. 500 million years ago was a world of trilobites and other strange sea creatures. 3.4 billion years ago was the world of the first living cells. And if you were to go back further still, scientists suspect that chains of a chemical called RNA, or something similar to RNA, kickstarted this entire beautiful mess that we call life. RNA is thought to have given rise to life for several reasons. Chains of RNA are found abundantly in all living cells today. RNA is a close chemical cousin to DNA. And with very little help from researchers, RNA chains can replicate 
evolve, and interact with their environments. While many details have yet to be worked out, the RNA world hypothesis is the simple idea that somewhere on our early planet, perhaps in a tide pool or hot spring, the Earth's chemistry was producing random chains of RNA. Once formed, they began replicating, evolving, and competing with each other for survival. As these chains evolved and diversified, some eventually began cooperating to produce the genetic code, a wide array of complex proteins, and even living cells which, from the perspective of RNA, can actually be thought of as houses or survival machines for RNA to live inside. To understand how RNA chains can interact with their environments, replicate, and evolve, we first need to understand the simple process of base pairing. Chains of RNA are made of nucleotides, small molecules that come in four different types labeled A, C, U, and G. The backbone atoms of a nucleotide, shown here as a yellow bar, can form strong chemical bonds with the backbone atoms of any other RNA nucleotide. This means that different chains can have completely different sequences from left to right. The parts we call the bases of nucleotides, the colored sections labeled A, C, U, or G, are attracted to other bases sort of like a magnet, but they're selective about who they will stick to. G selectively pairs with C, A selectively pairs with U. When bases find their matches and stick together, we call it base pairing. Researchers have found that with a little bit of assistance, Base pairing allows chains of RNA to replicate and evolve. Here's how it works. When a long chain of RNA is suspended in cool water with high concentrations of free nucleotides, the chain can act as a template for its own replication. Nucleotides automatically base pair with their partners on the existing chain. If their backbone atoms form chemical bonds with each other, and by the way, this is the part that currently requires assistance from researchers, we're not yet sure how this would have happened in the wild, a complementary RNA strand is born, one with the exact inverse sequence of the original. If the water is then heated, paired bases lose their grip, allowing both chains to act as templates when the cycle repeats. The great thing about this process is that every other RNA chain produced is a copy of the original, but sometimes mutations slip in. This means that as chains compete for survival and reproduction, true evolution, descent with modification, acted upon by selection, can operate on chains of RNA. As amazing as replication is, base pairing also gives RNA chains a second special ability. When placed in water cool enough for base pairing, but without enough free nucleotides for replication, chains will fold up and base pair with themselves. The end result is a complex shape with certain sticky bases pointing outward because they weren't able to find partners. These sticky, outward-facing bases can cause unique chemical reactions by interacting with other molecules in their environment. A folded chain of RNA capable of guiding a specific chemical reaction is what we call a ribozyme. Some ribozymes break certain molecules apart, others join certain molecules together. A ribozyme's specific function is determined by its specific shape, and its shape is determined by its sequence. If a mutation changes a ribozyme's sequence, the shape can be modified, and so can its function. When ribozymes were first discovered, scientists wondered how difficult it would be for random chains of RNA to evolve legitimate survival functions. Imagine, for example, a ribozyme that could build nucleotides out of molecules it finds in its environment. Across multiple generations, natural selection could promote and refine this ribozyme because the chain would tend to have access to more free nucleotides than its rivals, allowing it to replicate more often. To explore this idea, researchers at Simon Fraser University produced a large group of random RNA chains and examined them to see if any happened to be able to make nucleotides. Surprisingly, some actually could, but they weren't very efficient. Researchers selected out the successful chains and then used a lab technique called PCR to quickly replicate them with slight random mutations. After just 10 rounds of PCR, followed by selection, highly efficient nucleotide-building ribozymes evolved. These are molecules with the lifelike ability to actively participate in their own survival. These ribozymes, and many others produced through similar experiments, are beginning to blur the line between living things and simple chemistry. So to sum things up, the RNA world hypothesis is the simple idea that the first things to replicate and evolve on our planet may have been chains of RNA or something similar to them. 
While the basic idea of the RNA world does seem to give us a promising pathway to the origin of life, it's still very much a work in progress. As mentioned, one of several unsolved problems is, how did nature get backbone binding to function without the special enzymes or lab techniques we use today? While many researchers continue to focus on RNA, others are investigating alternative molecules, chemical systems that might replicate and evolve without assistance and could have given rise to RNA. Continual breakthroughs are being found in both avenues of research. I'm John Perry, and that's the RNA World Hypothesis stated clearly. So there we have it, the, the RNA World Hypothesis. I just want to open up to questions now. Well, I guess before that, just, just to mention that, that between the production of amino acids, we're actually getting small, pep, small proteins now. Um, as well with, with the work that Jay is doing. There's, there's a pretty big gap between things like the Miller-Urey experiment and things like the RNA world hypothesis. Obviously we saw that, that people have to intervene to get these systems to work. The really neat thing about RNA is that you, you start out with random chains and they evolve an incredible array of different abilities. And we think that uh, different RNAs cooperating and exploiting things like amino acids and small proteins in their environment could have actually given rise to the genetic code and everything else because these RNA chains, they act a lot like organisms do in that some of them will end up cooperating with each other. Uh, there's a really neat experiment where they had a, a bunch of RNAs that were replicating with enzymes. So when I talk about enzymes, I mean modern biological molecules are helping them replicate. And they also put in there uh, an RNA enzyme, so an enzyme that wants to digest RNA. So basically we put in a bunch of random chains of RNA we put in molecules that allow them to reproduce and we put in a predator to attack them. And they started to cooperate with each other to avoid the predator. Uh, they evolved all sorts of weird techniques to do this. And it, it's really fascinating. It's like we're looking at little animals, <laughs> little single, single chains of RNA that act like animals. It's a very fascinating field of research. It's super promising, but we just need to find a way now to connect that back to things like the Miller-Urey experiment. So, with that, questions? How do you decide what to work on? Is it from your partners or are you getting grants from? On my animations? Yeah. I actually figure, I just think, oh, I want to do an animation on this, and I call up the researchers and ask them if they want to help me with it and if they want to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if the answer is no, then I'll, I'll move on to something else. But the Center for Chemical Evolution has me do one a year, and I love this topic, so I get really excited. I'm hoping. I'm trying to convince them to let me do my next one on the origin of the genetic code. How do you go from RNA replicating to RNA building proteins? And keep my fingers crossed. Hopefully they'll let me do that because that's a really fascinating topic. But yes? Is there any conflict of interest if you're dealing with one lab that has one specific viewpoint and they fund you and another lab doesn't fund you and they completely disagree with uh, what you're putting forward? If I find that there's a conflict like that, I try to make sure that I put that in the video. So like with this video, I tried to make sure that it was very clear that there are major aspects of the RNA world that we have not solved. And that's how I deal with that. I mean, most, most research groups know that, I mean, you know if there's opposition to your findings. Uh, and I'll usually try to show the papers that are in opposition to the findings as well, or have links to them in the video description. That's how I've been dealing with that. Um, because I have had that ha happen several times, actually, where someone's really excited about this one thing, but there is opposition. And so I show that. I make sure to make that clear in the video. Can I make a comment related to that? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Ordinance of Life research is uh, every, a lot of times people have their, kind of their opinions on what they think happened. And sometimes when you go to some of these conferences, people have, like, well, they'll just give a talk where there's no data, and it's just all these ideas. And then there's always, thankfully, there's always one person that's like, where's, where's the data, right? Um, and it, it definitely, this, I mean, most of the things that John showed today are not, not like his, well, I mean, even the RNA world has some, some opposition to it, I guess. Um, but it's important to always keep in mind the science aspect of it, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna pose a question or like pose a claim, you need to have some type of scientific evidence to support it. And um, 
in certain in certain kind of subsections of this field, there are kind of camps where like certain some people like an example is um, kind of like the Darwin's warm little pond thing, like all the chemistry is in like enclosed body of water versus hydrothermal vents under the ocean, right? So some people think a lot of or origins of life chemistry happened in the hydrothermal vents, um, and, but it's not. It's not really like it has to be one or the other. Like obviously we don't know what it was, and so um, I think most good scientists in the field would are willing to kind of have space for multiple viewpoints on some of these things. Um, obviously, there's always a couple kooks in any field where like they like, no, this is how it happened, you know. But um, we weren't there, and so we don't know exactly how it happened. It's more about thinking about what was most plausible and what we can scientifically test. Question from a non chemist. What, uh, what has been the, the largest or most complex molecule that has come out of a, a Miller Urey type of blue type of experiment? And on the, the same point, what's the most complex, I guess, uh, RNA molecular interaction that's come out of these, these RNA experiments? Yeah, uh, well, so if you're asking like the most complex molecule in a milliuri type thing, uh, you mean complex as in biological and complex or, because I'm sure, I'm sure there's huge just random things that pop out of it if, if you consider that complex. But as far as like the largest protein, so, you know, it's only like a former, I, I believe. No, we can, and, get, we can get bigger than that. Yeah, what's, what's, what's the longest protein you've gotten? I mean, I can, I can, in my lab, I can make a protein, well, not a peptide, right? Like 15, 20 residues in length, right? So these okay. start, they start to fold and do certain chemistry. Um, and to answer your first question about what's like the biggest thing, are these molecules called tholins? Are these like really hydrophobic, kind of, kind of like clusters of carbon cycles? And they actually, they find them on uh, meteorites too, um, but we don't really think they do anything like biologically relevant because they're super insoluble. So like in order to like analyze them, you have to like basically eat them up with acid. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there is tons of stuff in there. Um, and, and, and we're really just scratching the surface of what we know, like what, what we're finding. And unfortunately, there's probably a lot more in there that we are actually, we're kind of eating away the molecules when we do, when we dissolve them or when we do the analysis, right? Things like sugars are really fragile molecules. And so even if sugars were present, the, the, the chemical sample preparation we do to analyze the samples is probably degrading them even before we can see them. Yeah. As far as complex RNAs, the one that I showed in the video is probably one of the most complex that, that we've been able to like, not only produce through evolution experiments, but then actually analyze to try and figure out how it works. Because you get a bunch of weird stuff, a bunch of weird uh, polymers, and it takes a lot of time and money to actually figure out, you know, what their sequence is and, you know, what, what it is that they're doing. But we get all, there's just all kinds of complicated things that happen. The thing that I find most interesting, and I wish, I'd have to pull up the, uh, the website to remember what the, the name of the paper was. There's a review on RNA experiments, and, that, and there they talk about this, the predator um, avoidance system. It's actually not just one uh, RNA chain that's involved in that avoidance, it's two, and they're cooperating with each other to make sure that they can both replicate uh, frequently enough to survive and make sure that the only nucleotides that they ever have exposed are ones that the predator can't attach onto. It's a really neat uh, kind of symbiosis between these two RNA strands. Um, I, w I would say that's probably the, one of the most interesting ones that's, that's happened, that we've been able to figure out how it works. That was really, it was, it was the question that I couldn't find good materials on. If I'm gonna spend a bunch of energy producing an animation, producing one of these videos, I wanna do it on something, there's, there's not already a whole bunch of really good materials out there already. And the origin of life, I could not find anything that was good. I was reading all kinds of books, and it was all really complicated, and I wanted to make something simple that you could understand in you know, middle school, high school level. And so that's why I decided to do Origin of Life. Yeah. How has your audience changed since you began first producing your Steve Clear videos? I guess it's just grown. <laughs> um, I, it's hard to tell if demographics have changed that much because 
it's hard to track demographics until you have a large enough audience. And the other thing that's tricky for me is teachers show my videos in classrooms. YouTube only gives me data on, you know, how old is the person? Are they male or female? Uh, but that's whoever owns the YouTube account that's being played on. So there's actually a bias in YouTube stats for, for kids' stuff to uh, adult men because kids are using their dad's account a lot. So it's actually sort of hard to track just with YouTube statistics, but it got bigger, yeah. Um, because many of this audience are, are science majors, um, mm. biologists, chemists, students um, who may stay in the sciences. What advice would you give to this audience as they move through their career to be successful advocates for science and communicators of science? And I'm already discounting that us faculty members <laughs> okay. There's a couple of things that I think gives me an edge over researchers. And the first thing is that I'm learning all this for the first time right before I create an animation. And the benefit that I have with that is that I'm having all these aha moments and I remember them. I remember all the things that finally clicked. So as you're studying, whenever you have one of those crazy aha moments where it just feels good, like I finally understand this, take note of that and remember it and bring that up every time you're talking to someone new in the field or someone who just has questions about it because whatever clicked for you is probably gonna click for somebody else as well. And there's this, you know, the curse of knowledge. By the time you've got your PhD, you forgot what it's like not to know what you know. <laughs> and it becomes hard to communicate to your next door neighbor about what you do. The other big thing is to avoid jargon. Jargon is actually super important. Jargon is just new vocabulary words that scientists invent so they can shortcut and have conversations with each other that make sense. But you have to learn all those words, and they're complicated words. And sometimes people just add extra words for no reason. I have a talk that I do called uh, Superfluous Jargon is an Impediment to Communication. <laughs> Some people don't get that that title is a joke. <laughs> uh, there's so many words. We, we, we're used to flowery words in science. People add extra words when they're doing scientific journals and when they're writing to make themselves sound smart. And that's exactly the opposite thing you should, we should be encouraging. Uh, just use normal language. And if you're going to use jargon, explain what it means first. And then you can use it in the rest of your you know, spiel. But those are the two, the two big things. Keep your language simple and remember your aha moments. Okay, well, if you guys don't have any more questions, let's thank John again. <laughs>